Next, we will hear from Heather McTeer Tony, Vice President of Community Engagement at the Environmental Defense Fund. In 2014, she was appointed by President Barack Obama as Regional Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency Southeast Region. Known for her energetic and genuine commitment to people, her work has made her a national figure in the area of public service, environmental justice, and community engagement, and we're so honored to have her with us today. Heather? Hello, and thanks so much. And thanks to all of you all for, for joining us uh, today. I'm coming to you from the land of the Chickasaw and Choctaw people uh, in what we know as the state of Mississippi, Oxford, Mississippi. This is my home, and I'm very glad to be sharing with you today. Um, we'll move to the next slide. Uh, no slide, actually. I'm not going to use slides. Uh, so let's turn the slides off for a moment, because uh, we want to have a conversation and talk through what are some of the elements to actually implementing the things that John just talked about. It's important that we know the what of needs to be, what needs to be done, but more uh, I, I attuned to what I'm working on is the how do we do it? How do we practically apply and encourage communities to embrace and be empowered to take control of what their public health will be. And so there are a few elements that I want to walk through with you, and I look forward to the conversation about how do we actually get these solutions really uh, embedded into communities such that we can see strong climate actions take place and that there is true equitable solutions that are available to all of us. When we think about the elements of equity and the elements that we need to apply, in order to make climate solutions um, really stick in our communities, there are four elements that I want to share with you, and I've tried to make this easy so that they're all ease and we can all remember them and repeat them, quite frankly, uh, amongst one another and really share. Uh, the first one is dealing with ethics in and of itself. Ethics and remembering and understanding that coming to this place, we have to, uh, in a number of ways, share power and really dig into how we are showing up as public health officials, as government officials, but also the importance of the health impacts that people experience each and every day as a result of climate change. I love the title of this series, Climate Change is Health, because climate change really is a driver to how we are adapting, how we are experiencing, and how we're becoming more resilient each and every day. We see it in and through our public health means uh, in communities all around the country. And so understanding the ethics of showing up, how we show up, is an important element to ensuring that we are implementing these factors each and every day in the same way. We have to show up transparently, authentically and understanding the diverse communities, which really have to, um, th that we have to focus on because they are the first hit as well as the ones that are uh, recovering quite often from the climate impacts as they're increasing each and every single year. So ethics is number one, uh, keeping that at the forefront of how we go into these communities. The second one is experience. And this is so important. It is respecting the lived experience of community members. It's also the place that we see a lot of intersections. And when we are talking about public health, climate change, and how we go into these communities, there are a few things that came from David's presentation I really want to bring uh, into light with respect to how we practically apply these. One is the history of communities and what we have to overcome in terms of our own experience in these spaces, the, the presence that local, federal, and state governments have played into how we got here in the first place. So one of the slides that was shared was redlining maps that came as a result of discriminatory redlining practices in the United States. And I'm so excited that that was one of the slides that was used because it respects and understands the intersection of housing intersection of education, of permitting laws, of pollution, and how they came to be in these communities. And if we ignore that past history, that past lived experience, we take away from people who are living the experience today what they've had to go through just to get to where they are right now. 
So when you go to the doctor, you usually give a medical history of your family. Your doctor asks you to fill out a form that says whether or not you have a family history of asthma, health, uh, chronic health diseases, um, cancer. Uh, they ask you if you had any surgeries. When you think of lived experience and it comes to climate change and public health, think of what is that medical history or that experience history from public health perspective for that particular community as we're going in and talking about solutions. Does that community have a history, a public health history that is disparate and different from other areas? Because understanding that history makes it so that we are deeply seeding really the solution that people want, they need, and that they're trying to recover from. We have seen through the experience of COVID that public health impacts and climate change impacts hit communities differently. And so a community that has been on the forefront of climate change, that is a low com income community, oftentimes communities of color, oftentimes communities that have been uh, underserved, underutilized, are the first ones to not only experience climate change in terms of being on the front line, but have the least resources. And they have had those historically. So understanding that lived experience can make a difference in terms of how and when we're able to really implement climate policy and pollution, uh, climate policies and regulations that will stick and that communities can move forward. The next place is expectations. There is a saying, Communities move at the speed of trust. The rest of the world tries to move at the speed of light, environmental movements, speed of light, but communities really move at the speed of trust. And that is so true. We all understand and know that climate change really is an existential crisis that is impacting global populations in ways that we cannot even imagine. And we're living it each and every single day. At the same time, when we rush these solutions, it often comes at the sacrifice and the detriment of those who are hardest hit, who are first hit, and are more likely to suffer uh, extraordinary traumatic responses as a result. And so sometimes moving slower is moving faster. And we have to understand and really think through how we're coming into communities and what expectations are with respect to our timing and the community's timing of what they want to receive, how they're looking to receive it, and really how we are uh, deeply intersecting climate solutions that, again, empower communities, engage them, and that they can carry on. The last fourth area is economics, and I want to spend a little time here. Because all too often we think about environmental justice and climate change in communities of color and those who are hardest hit in terms of a victimization, people need to and are recovering from uh, environmental injustices that have plagued uh, our communities for so long. But let's think about the opportunity. Climate change, green technology, clean energy jobs is putting us in a position to really transform wealth and health in communities all across the country. And this is a really special moment. I've spent time, I, well, I live in the Southeast, but I've spent a lot of time in and around communities that are often considered environmental justice. And one thing that I hear more often than not is where's the conversation about what the future is going to be? So many people come to communities and say, we want to help reduce pollution. We want to help improve the disparate health impacts that are experienced by these communities. But what are my kids going to do in the next 15 years? What kind of jobs can we link to this recovery that also provide a regeneration for these communities? Thinking about the innovative ways that through health and climate, we can create not just salary jobs, but really truly, uh, I'm sorry, not just hourly jobs, but really truly sort of salary, long-term benefits in the health sector that create opportunities that we're expanding and improving the health and well-being for a community, as well as reducing the disparate health impacts. All of these things intersect. We cannot have one without the other. 
So as we are talking about and thinking through an amazing set of policies that we now have an opportunity to implore, we know what to do, the how to do it has to come in line with it. President Biden's administration has put forth an all of government approach. They have really been forefront, at the forefront of of talking about environmental justice in a way that we have not really seen. But the all of government approach cannot exist by itself. There has to be an all of community approach, which includes local leaders, public health care leaders, academia, philanthropy, uh, faith-based community. There has to be an all of community approach that helps the policy development to be implemented and really embrace and carry forward so that we're building one upon the other and really getting to efficient climate change solutions that are helpful and healthful for us all. That's why climate changing health is such an impactful way to say that we have this opportunity right now to dig into the how and accompanying it with the what we need to do. Let's go back through those again, and I look forward to the conversation. Thinking through the ethics, making sure that we're coming into communities in a way that is respectful, that understands the importance of sharing this power, where we've had in some spaces majority power that really needs to be shared with communities so that they can implement the policy in the way that they know best in their own communities. The experience, lived experience and intersections of public health, education, climate change, violence, the number of different ways that there are health indicators as well as opportunities to understand the intersections and the experience of the community such that they can really implore climate solutions. The expectations, which is the timing and how communities move at a speed of trust. Ethics helps us build, to that, build that trust, but we have to move in a way that sometimes slower means faster, but it gets us there at the end point. And then finally, the economics, ensuring that we're not just talking to communities about how to improve their health, because that mother who has three kids and two of them have asthma, she still has to go to work. She has still has to put food on the table and her timing might be different than ours. When we talk about what emissions are and how they're impacting her family, we have to think through the timing and make sure that it's suitable uh, and achievable for all of us and those economics. That is critical. Those are the opportunities that are wide open for all of us to jump into by putting the policy together with how we do it and how we enter these spaces. Uh, we'll go to the last next slide. This is my information, contact information. I'm really looking forward to digging into this and getting some really good questions about the how, the practical nature of putting these into place. It's one of the things that I'm excited about uh, us doing at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, I'm a former mayor, I come from the federal government. So uh, this is a happy space for me to see us actually implementing these climate policies that have taken so long for us to really be in a position to implore. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Heather.